So our final, final briefing for the semester uh, is a Professor Rosen's group, and they're talking about urban reforestation. So if you're ready to begin. Hello, everyone. Hello to the viewers from home as well. My name is Matteo Chiedal. I'm very, very excited to be representing the group that has worked for a whole summer to investigate the Urban Reforestation Act. So let me start by thanking this amazing group and thanking Professor Rosen for all of the amazing advice. On the agenda for today, I'll set a little bit of context behind the Urban Reforestation Act. Uh, then we will investigate its structure and goals. We will see how trees can benefit urban areas. Um, we will touch on the challenges that this bill and urban forestry are facing, and then I will leave you with a little bit of a conclusion. But uh, I would like to start this morning by talking about uh, Yonkers. Uh, this article specifically talks about the experience of a few citizens uh, just a few kil um, miles north from here uh, that were basically trapped in their own homes because they depended on the air conditioning in order to cope with the extreme heat that has been going on in the past few weeks. Uh, the recorded temperature on July 24th was 107 degrees Fahrenheit compared to the 97 degrees that was expected based on forecast. As you can see from the picture, uh, sometimes it's actually way too often it's, um, there's not enough tree coverage or shade to find any relief from this heat. And as it is specifically this aspect of the way that we've been building cities uh, with a lot of disregard for vegetation that uh, have disrupted many ecosystem services, such as uh, temperature regulation, the hydrological system, natural air filtration, and in general, terrestrial biomes. And all of this has, have created very urban-specific problems, such as the urban heat island effect, water drain drainage issues, air pollution, biodiversity loss, and a plethora of health risks. We also cannot forget that climate change is looming all over this and making a lot of these problems even worse. The reason why we care is because population density through New York State is highly concentrated in urban areas. 91% of the population of New York State lives in cities, and this corresponds to 18 million people in around 90 cities. With a few exceptions, within cities, tree canopy, canopy is decreasing. There have been past attempts to revert this decrease, uh, an example of it is the Million Trees Project here in New York City that did a lot of things right. It actually planted uh, all of the trees that it promised, and it raised a lot of awareness on the advantages of trees within urban areas. However, it crucially lacked a long-term plan to maintain those trees and keep them alive in, in, the, in the future. There is already a law that uh, points at vegetation in trees as a potential mitigation tool uh, for all of the problems that I've mentioned just now. And that's the Environmental Conservation Law. The Urban Reforestation Act that we're talking about right now builds on top of the Environmental Conservation Law by creating a funding stream for urban forestry, allocating those funds out to the cities through the state, and also defining a few key activities for the success of this program. According to Assemblymember McMahon, that is the sponsor of this bill, uh, there is a potential to collect $11 million per year, and this corresponds to 7,500 trees per year. And this might seem like a relatively small impact compared to the one million tree project that we talked about just before. However, it is an opportunity to create a small incremental change with a long-term focus. More in detail, the Urban Reforestation Act uh, works on three different laws. It amends the environmental conservation law that we just talked about by creating the dedicating funding stream, mandating the hiring of professional foresters, calling for a few specific activities such as planning, planting, removal, and pruning. It also amends the highway law by um, creating a thousand dollar annual fee on billboards that are visible from highways and thoroughways through the state. It also sets a few rules to protect small, small businesses. Finally, uh, it amends the finance law to create that fund and distribute the funds out uh, based on grants and population density. But let's take a step back. Uh, why are we talking about trees and vegetation? How do they help in urban areas? Uh, 
one way that they help is by addressing the urban heat island effect, which is the effect by which the temperature within a city are much higher than the temperatures outside of them. A study from the University of South Carolina has, sh has shown that uh, vegetation within cities can reduce peak temperature by two to nine degrees Fahrenheit. And this happens in a couple of different ways, through evapotranspiration, that is the combination of evaporation of water from soil and surface, and the transpiration of the water through the leaves of, the, of these trees, but also more mechanically by preventing solar radiation to arrive to the surface below the canopy of the trees. They also help with uh, reducing stormwater runoff. And this is especially important as with climate change, we're expecting extreme events to become much uh, more frequent and intense. This happens through increased infiltration, uh, and this is more of a property of the soil in which the plants are located that is able to absorb a lot more water compared to the impervious surfaces uh, that uh, we've been using to build our cities. Uh, we also need to mention increased evapotranspiration, like we mentioned before. Instead of having the water flow in our pipes, it's released back out into the air. And then more mechanically, uh, trees help directly intercept rainwater, so slowing down that peak amount of water that hits our drainage systems immediately. Uh, trees also, also help with improvement in air quality. Uh, a study that focused on New York City uh, showed that they are able to filter up to 11% of particulate pollutants and other gases. This happens by trees being able to absorb gases via their leaf surface cells, but also uh, through the physical structure of the branches and the leaves of the trees, uh, they obstruct and disperse airborne particles in general. Among other benefits, uh, we need to mention the decrease in energy load throughout the year. There's a reduction in cooling demand in the summer and a reduction in, in heating demand in the winter that can sum up to a uh, peak energy uh, load reduction of 10%. Uh, they also help with he human health. We've mentioned how they help with decreasing temperature and therefore also decrease heat-related illnesses. Uh, but also closeness to vegetation and proximity to vegetation help with reducing stress uh, lowering blood pressure and boosting the immune system. And finally, vegetation and trees have a, a very obvious relationship with biodiversity. They provide a habitat for local species. They uh, help by reducing noise, which happens to be a major hurdle for e ecosystems to be established. And finally, they also create corridors for wildlife to move from hub to hub within cities. While all of these benefits are obviously very positive, it is important to highlight a few challenges that this act and urban forestry in general need to face. First of all, the Urban Reforestation Act has unfortunately been blocked before. In 98 and in 2008 it was already proposed. And back then, uh, the billboard lobby, which um, I need to remind you is this, the funding stream for um, all of these activities, uh, was able to defeat the, bi the bill. What is changing here in 2022? Well, there is a supermajority through the legislative uh, branches in, um, uh, in New York State, but also bills that tackle environmental issues are much more popular today than they were back then. A second very important challenge is that uh, with the Urban Reforestation Act, we're talking about a long-term investment. On average, trees take 30 to 40 years to reach full maturity, and only then all of those benefits that I talked about before are able to be seen. In cities, this is even harder because cities, in cities, trees have a lot more challenges to compete with in order to reach that maturity. Some of the stressors that they face are restricted root space, uh, the soil composition being completely different to the one that they can find in nature, the water quality, quantity, and frequency that they receive, and also an increase in invasive species and disease threat because cities are major hubs of trade and exchange. So this puts a lot of pressure on successful maintenance in the long term of all of these trees. And in order to ensure that this maintenance happens, uh, there's, uh, we can use short-term and long-term goals. Uh, in the short term, these are uh, very tangible and easy to understand, like a net increase in trees in urban areas, the survival of new healthy trees uh, that have been planted just in the past three years, and the survival of existing trees that are maybe a little bit older. However, we cannot forget the long-term goals uh, that are the reduction in surface and ambient temperature, the stormwater runoff reduction, and improvements in air pollution and 
and public health. The challenge here is that attributing all of these benefits specifically to trees is extremely difficult because of a couple of different reasons. On one side, there might be other activities that are addressing those specific problems and changing a little bit what the expectation is, but also there's climate change looming all over this, uh, especially with rising temperature and an increase in uh, storms uh, that might change the storm water runoff expectation there. So urban vegetation is a very promising tool to mitigate a lot of the problems that are caused by the way that we've been building cities and that are uh, made even worse by climate change. The Urban Reforestation Act, while it might seem like a relatively small intervention, has the potential to impact a lot of people and is definitely a step in the right direction. Thank you very much. I'm happy to open up for questions. Good job, Matteo. Thank you, Sion. Oh, anyway, um, <laughs> so I'm, I understand why urban forestation is important, um, but I'm still a little bit confused on what the connection between billboards and urban forestation is, because you know when I think about these environmental problems, a lot of the time the people who are, um, for example, let's say there's like chemicals in river, the person who's um, responsible for paying for that is usually the pollutant, right? Polluter. Um, but in this case, it seems a little bit more convoluted. Um, and also just I'm thinking about like funding streams from billboards, really how, how sustainable is that, right? So just curious to know the connection there. That is a very, very good question. Um, one thing that I would like to mention is the historical context on how this act was created in the first place. Uh, the first time that it was proposed was 98, uh, where the world of advertising would have looked much, much different than it, than it does today. Um, regarding the amount of budget that we can expect from something like this, uh, I believe it's something that we will tackle next year, and we're gonna be able to have much better estimates of what uh, the billboard uh, funding stream can bring to this um, act. Thank you for the question. Matteo, congratulations for the presentation and extend the compliments to your group as well. Uh, recently, we had some field trips uh, with the urban ecology class, and we've met some uh, restoration project uh, in the city of New York. And you mentioned in your presentation that there is an increasing awareness of this urban uh, forestry uh, issue. And do you have uh, data regarding if this increasing awareness increased the green areas in New York or is decreased the green area? How this, uh, this things going on? Thank that's you. A, that's a, a very, very good question. Uh, earlier on in the presentation, I mentioned that with some exceptions, urban uh, areas are losing tree canopy. Uh, one exceptions, uh, exception to this is um, uh, New York City in the past, uh, in a specific section of the past 10 years. And that was because of the Million Tree Project. It actually did plant a lot of trees through the city. However, we found also data about uh, other cities throughout the state that keep losing it. Uh, an example of it is Buffalo. Buffalo has been losing 500 trees per year f uh, through the past uh, five years. Uh, even though it has been planting trees throughout. Uh, and um, that shows that even though uh, there is an, ef uh, an effort to keep planting these, and so the awareness is there, it is still not enough uh, to compete with the loss of vegetation through many of the cities of New York State. Thank you very much. Well, we have just seen, I think, some excellent presentations. Let me make one point about uh, the connection between billboards and trees, in case you're wondering. So uh, Lyndon Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, pushed for something called highway beautification. This was one of her issues. And there were rules made about how close you could have billboards to interstate highways. And that's why you don't see on interstate highways 
a lot of billboards very close to the road, the way you used to have on US highways. In fact, what happened is they moved them further and made them bigger, but that's a different story. <laughs> but I think the connection between uh, sort of the natural environment and billboards was really this idea that you should be able to, to travel down a highway without seeing a lot of commercial signs. And that, this is a 50 or 60 year old issue, so I didn't expect anybody here to know much about it, but I actually uh, studied it and think, think it was an interesting effort. And of course what happened was they, like I said, they just removed the, the, the signs went further away, uh, and then with electric signs, you, you know, they just light up the whole neighborhood. So uh, that's how sometimes rules get uh, you know, destroyed. In any case, uh, excellent briefing. So uh, a couple of thoughts about, about your work this semester. First of all, these briefings were excellent, really, really excellent. And, and I, I know that we get used to it because we keep seeing each other doing this, but this is really a spectacular demonstration of an ability to take a lot of complex information and boil it down to five, ten minute briefings. Uh, this is a really important skill to have in a world that's very complicated. The decision makers only have so much time and so much bandwidth, and you've got to get across key messages to them and be thinking about, do I really need this? In the, you know, part of what you had to do in, in, in putting these briefings together is make a lot of trade-offs about what information should we be presenting. And I'm sure it was painful to leave out some of the things that you knew. Uh, a clever way to deal with it is to put them in the appendices and, and, and plant some questions in the audience. So good job uh, for those of you who did that. Uh, an interesting way to deal with that kind of a problem. But the, the, the point is, though, that it's the analysis of what's important and what's central uh, that each of these groups today, each of your groups did really, really a spectacular job. Uh, those of us who haven't been part of your group could follow the discussion, we understood the science, we understood what you were talking about, the definition of the problem. And so you need to think about that as a really significant accomplishment. And I, I'm reminding you of this because when you're in the middle of this, it just seems like, oh, that's what we're doing. You know, but when you get out of this class and you're taking classes with some of your SEPA colleagues in electives next semester, you'll see they don't know how to do any of this stuff. And it will be frustrating to you. You'll be in a group, and, and you know, instead of the 10-minute briefing, it'll be 25 minutes, and you know, there you go. Uh, but the world is built around uh, being able to focus decision makers on what's most important. And, and you really did a wonderful job of doing that. I think the other thing that I am really pleased to see is how kind you are to each other uh, and the culture of the program. Uh, not trying to compete, not trying to show each other up, but in fact, uh, congratulating each other on the work. And, and I like that for two reasons. One is we're in a field that's very challenging, and we need everybody here to be in it, and we need everybody to be working together. Uh, this is a complicated field. You know, you know Professor Cook ha has a background in, in, in veterinarian medicine. Uh, and Professor Palmer is actually a, a real scientist, and and uh, <laughs> and then there's you know Professor Jossa, Professor Apps, and Professor Rosen, and I who uh, you know have different kind of backgrounds. The the point is we all have to learn. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean to to say that it's lesser, Howard. You know, just in any case, the point is we have to learn how to talk to each other and how to understand each other. Uh, one of the things that I found in, in my career so far is that scientists uh, are really pretty bad at understanding public policy. Uh, they don't know it though, and so they propose all these things uh, that you know, don't get anywhere. So this fellow won the Nobel Prize for uh, proposing a carbon tax in the 1970s, which I knew from the beginning of my studies would never happen, uh, and guess what? Uh, the proposal that went through the Congress was all incentives, only a little bit of a penalty on methane, very small, and the, the, that's already happening. The point is that we need to be in a dialogue with people from different disciplines and be able to explain to each other what we know about how the world works. And that's part of what you're learning how to do uh, in this program, and you're doing really effectively, and you just provided us with five demonstrations of, that, of those facts. 
So I want to congratulate the groups. I'd like everybody to give everybody a round of applause for a great job. And, and let me say, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the fall semester when we talk about management, which is something I know something about. So we'll see you all next semester.